Good morning. My name is Iqbal Khan. I am a technology evangelist at Alachi Soft. We're a San Francisco Bay Area based company, um, and we have a product called Encash. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, how you can scale your .NET applications with distributed caching. Um, and um, I would prefer to keep it a more interactive discussion so that as you have questions, please uh, raise your hand and let's have a more of a discussion-oriented presentation here. OK, I'm going to get started. I'll start with a few definitions, which I'm sure most of you know already. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, but just for uh, completeness purposes. So the first definition is scalability. Uh, scalability, uh, as I uh, see it, as a high application performance under peak loads. So if you have an application that has only five users and it performs super fast, it's not scalable until it performs super fast with 5,000 or 500,000 users. Um, so if you can do that, then your application is scalable. Uh, and if you can't, then you need to figure out how to make it scalable. Um, linear scalability is more of a, your deployment um, um, definition. If you are deploying your application and if you can add more servers and incrementally increase the, the transaction capacity, let's say if you have 5,000 users and you're slowing down, you add a fifth or a sixth server to your web farm. If, you, if the performance suddenly improves, then you're linearly scalable, if you can keep on doing that. If you cannot, if you reach a stage where no matter how many servers you add, it's just the performance is not improving, um, then your application is not linearly scalable. Um, um, and I'll, I'm just, I'll come to the details of this, but um, so what are the applications that need scalability? If you're doing web applications, ASP.NET or other uh, languages, you definitely need scalability uh, if, you, if you have a lot of users. If you have web services, um, that's another very good candidate for needing scalability if you have a lot of uh, requests coming to your web services. If you have a backend for IoT, which is usually a web services backend anyway, but just wanted to mention that, that's another good uh, situation where you would need scalability. Uh, if you have a big data processing where you need to process a lot of data and in a distributed fashion, uh, you, you need scalability. Or any other applications, server applications. So we're only talking server applications. We're not talking desktop or mobile client side applications. Um, so these are the applications that need scalability and usually have problems. So what is the scalability problem? Um, First of all, as you probably know already, the application tier scales in a fairly linear fashion. You uh, can add more servers, and uh, you can pretty much, in a load balanced environment, as you add more servers, your application scales. But it's the data storage that is the bottleneck. And the data storage is the relational databases or your legacy data. Um, this is data that you cannot live without. You have to have it, um, and it's not scaling. Um, and, and no SQL databases uh, are not always the answer. I, I missed the word always. Um, <laughs> um, you know, if you can move your data to a no SQL database, great. You know, uh, we also have a no SQL database, an open source no SQL database for .NET called NOSDB that will help you do that. But a lot of the time, you just cannot move all your data. A, a lot of your business data, your customers, your accounts, have to stay in a relational database or your legacy data uh, in your mainframe, whatever the, um, the, the data store is. So while NoSQL databases is great, it requires you to kind of ditch your existing database and move to it, uh, which is not possible at times. And because that's not possible, it is not always the answer. Uh, if you can move some of the data to NoSQL database, great. You know, that's another topic that, you know, I can talk about, but for today, uh, we're going to stick to the situations, which is majority of the cases where you have to keep your business data 
in a relational database. Uh, and regardless of what database that is, that's SQL Server, that's Oracle, DB2, MySQL, just the relational databases, the design and the architecture of them are not distributed in nature, so they cannot scale. So they become a bottleneck. Uh, so that is the, the, the problem that you need to overcome. And the solution is to use an in-memory distributed cache. Um, and cache is an open source distributed cache. You have Redis. Um, you used to have AppFabric. It's going away uh, next year. Um, so you can put a distributed cache in between the application and your database. And that is how you solve your scalability problem. Um, so just look at this picture. So you have your application tier up here. You can add more servers. This is usually a load balancer. I didn't show a load balancer up here because you might not have a load balancer in every situation. But you have multiple servers running your application um, and you can add more servers at this layer. You cannot add more servers here, at least these two pieces. You, you can add more servers in the NoSQL database, but you cannot add to the relational or the legacy. So the way you do it is you put an, a caching layer in between. Um, and a, a cache is just like the application here. It's a distributed in-memory store. Um, and it's a really powerful concept that you pretty much, uh, you know, if you, have an app, if you have a scalable environment, you need to consider kind of putting that as part of your overall infrastructure. That you always should have a, a, an in-memory distributed cache as the store. Um, and multiple applications can share a common caching infrastructure, or each application can have its own. That's your organizational's uh, uh, preferences. But by having an in-memory distributed you know, cache as your store, you suddenly have a capability uh, of scalability that you would not have if you didn't have it. Uh, and now you, you can cache as much data as you want, and the more data you cache, the less you go to the database, and the less bottleneck that database becomes. I've put about 80% of the time you should be reading your, or, or accessing your data from your cache. Uh, now, this cache is very different from the traditional concept of a cache, which was a standalone in-memory cache, which was part of the application process. You have ASP.NET cache object that does that. That improves application performance. It does not improve scalability because you cannot build a large cache. You cannot put a lot of data. You cannot share that cache across multiple applications or multiple instances of the same application. Um, so if you think about this picture here, you, you should have a minimum of two cache servers for redundancy purposes. Um, and also, you know, for scalability purposes. If you don't need two, you probably don't need a distributed cache. Uh, you would need a cache if, you know, the basic rule of thumb that we use, and we've been this, in this space for a long time now, is that you should have a minimum of two or three servers in the application tier to be needing a distributed cache. If you don't have a minimum of two or three servers, you can just live with a standalone uh, cache. Um, uh, this cache, so the, the nice thing about this cache is that this will pull... So there's a caching cluster here. So I should actually use the mouse. So there's a cache cluster. So this is a cluster of cache servers. It's a TCP-based cluster in case of NCache. Other products do their own. Most of them do a TCP-based, by the way. Uh, and it, this cluster pools the resources of these servers together into one logical capacity. So you have memory as one capacity. You have CPU as a second capacity. And you have network card as a third capacity. So those are the three bottlenecks that you're overcoming um, by having a cache. Memory grows, of course. Uh, storage is not a problem with a database. You can have a lot of data stored. It's how much transactions per second that you want to do. Um, so uh, when you have more memory, uh, by adding more servers, because it's an in-memory cache, memory is limited. So by having scalable memory storage, you're sort of overcoming that limitation to a certain extent. By having CPU pooled, means that more transactions per second. If you only had 1,000 requests per second, maybe you, uh, two cache servers are enough. But if you go to 5,000 requests per second, maybe you need to add a third or a fourth server. Uh, and by adding more servers, you're basically uh, adding more CPU capacity. The third bottleneck is the network card. Network cards are becoming pretty 
um, high bandwidth, you have 10 gigabit pretty much now standard in uh, production environments. But if you have large objects, if, you're, if, you're, if your average object is only a few hundred bytes, you're probably never going to max out the network card uh, if you keep adding more servers. But if your average object size is 10 MB or 1 MB or, or, or a few hundred K at least, you can very quickly max out the network card if you put load on it. Um, so these are things that, as a developer, you don't usually think about. These are more of you know IT people will think, but uh, this is what really happens uh, if you put a database. One of the reasons a database becomes a bottleneck is on the, these three uh, situations: memory, CPU, and the network card. Okay. So, as I said, there the, are the, the two groups of applications that need caching. One is the big data, which is so, sort of a batch processing, and you want to just reduce the time it takes to execute that query, make it as clo close to real time as possible. And the other is what I call e-commerce applications, the web apps, the web services, the IoT, that need to be up all the time. The e-commerce applications usually don't have uh, that much data. They have a lot of transactions. They, they do have tens of gigabytes uh, of data that they cache at, at, at the minimum. Our average customer caches about 30 to 60 gigs of data um, uh, because they, they have so many. But a big data processing would need a lot more servers here. Um, and and, and uh, an average server uh, in an e-commerce situation, an average server is about 16 gig of uh, memory is what people use in, an, in one server. And you can take it up to 128 or 256 gig. But the more memory you add, the more CPU you need. You need. Why? Because memory has to be collected. And the garbage collector consumes CPU. So the bigger amount of storage per server you have, the stronger the CPU you will need. Uh, so if you, have, if you had 128 gig of memory in each server, and if you had a 50 server cluster, that's at least 5 TB, right? That's 5 terabytes. So you are able to do things in a terabyte. And that is another use case. Um, uh, the distributed caches are not a replacement of Hadoop uh, for big data processing. Uh, they're only a replacement of faster Hadoop. So if you want to do, there's some data that you want to process that is more uh, real time, more, and it's, it's smaller in nature, maybe not as big, uh, but it's more real time. But it still goes into hundreds of gigabytes of data that a typical database is just not able to handle uh, very easily. Uh, you can uh, deploy that uh, into a cache cluster, have 10, 20 servers, uh, and, and these are cheap servers. These are, as I said, dual CPU, quad core type of boxes. 16 to 32 gig each. And in, the, in a big data case, you increase the memory. So if you have a du dual CPU quad core box, you can take 128 gig of memory easily. So, so you would say that it would be a mid tier big data. It wouldn't, it wouldn't scale cost effectively beyond kind of mid tier big data, like mid mini big data. Exactly. And, and because it's in memory, you know, the, you know it, it has a specialized use. It's much faster than Hadoop. You know. Things that you would do in days in Hadoop, uh, this one is going to do in um, hours. You know, uh, and things that you do, did in hours, this one can do in minutes. So there are things that you want to analyze much faster that Hadoop is just not set out for. So that's where you would use a distributed cache, in-memory cache. By the way, NCache does have a MapReduce capability, so that you can implement uh, MapReduce in .NET and deploy it. And that MapReduce code runs within the cache process. So it accesses all the data in an object form. So it's, it's like, so the, imagine if all the data that you were processing were kept on your heap in object form. 
that's super fast compared to anything you would go and get it get from the disk or even get it from an external store in a serialized form. Sure, sure. So the, the, the most common case of a distributed cache is an e-commerce application. Um, so uh, any questions on this picture in terms of what a distributed cache does, how does it scale? Okay. So uh, the linear scalability is what you need. So as you add more servers, you want the the number of reads or, or writes to grow in a linear fashion. So as you can see, um, in case of NCache, a, a two-server cluster would do about 32,000 writes per second, 50,000 reads per second. The, this is like one K object size as the be benchmark. Then you go from 32 to 48, 64, 80, 96, and so forth. And the reads are faster uh, because in case of writes, there's also replication happening. So that's the, that's the reason it's not as fast as the reads. If you turn off the replication, then the reads and the writes are the same performance. Okay, let's come now to more of a dev-focused stuff. You know, we've talked about more of a deployment architecture. So what are the things that, as a de developer, you should be using a distributed cache for, as a .NET developer? The most common, of course, is application data caching, uh, where you cache the data. That's what we were just talking about. You cache data that's in your database and so that you don't have to go to the database as frequently. So in case of application data caching, the thing to keep in mind here is that the data exists in two places. One is in your cache. Second is in the database. So the cache has to take care of this reality. What's the biggest concern when a data exists in two places? It gets out of sync. So the data integrity uh, is, is uh, very, very important. If a cache cannot handle data integrity, then you are forced to cache only read-only data or sort of read-only data. Um, and read-only data is only less than 50%, probably 30% of your total data usage. 70% or more is your, what, I, what I call transactional data, your customers, your accounts, that you can cache only for a very short time, but you don't want to take the risk of it going bad. So that's the first, and we'll talk about this. Second is if you have ASP.NET applications, um, at the minimum, you need to store your sessions because the session storage options that Microsoft gives you out of the box are in proc, state servers, uh, probably not there in Azure at least, but, and the second is SQL. Both of those are not viable options for a really serious application. So you need to have um, a store which is much faster and more scalable, and an in-memory distributed cache is a perfect place to keep your sessions. Now, in, so there is, there's a session, and if you're not using the MVC, and if you're still in the old framework, uh, then AS, the, the view state is there also. Then the third is output cache. In case of ASP.NET caching, the situation is different. There's only one place that the data exists, and that's the cache. If the data exists only in one place, what's the biggest concern? Data loss. You know, you might lose it. So if you've got a customer who's got the, on the last page of your e-commerce basket and suddenly he has to start all over again, you know, you might lose him. You know, you might say, I'm just going to go somewhere else. And if it was an airline with, where that was more than a thousand dollar purchase, you've got, you know, so you don't want to lose data. So replication becomes very important in case of transient data. The third common use case, which is not that commonly understood, actually, is that our distributed cache is a very powerful platform for runtime data sharing. Things that you t traditionally did with uh, message queues, uh, enterprise service buses. Um, uh, this is uh, a distributed cache is because it's much faster, it's in memory, it's distributed, it's scalable. Um, it's a perfect place to share this data that's temporary in nature. You know, something that you created at runtime and you needed to share with some other instance of your application, this is a perfect place. So, uh, and that's usually an event-driven data sharing pub-sub type of a model. Uh, there's, 
There is also this feature called continuous query, which is a way to monitor a data set. It's like a SQL dependency, except it's not on database, and it's, it's on the cache. So again, runtime data sharing, the data exists only in one place, so you don't want to lose it. So three different dynamics of this. The fourth is the big data, which we didn't talk about here, which, which I, because you know, this was more of a uh, dev focused. Big data is, is a totally different picture. Uh, in case of big data, the data stays in the cache um, and, and you run sort of queries on them. Um, it, you know, the data might be offloaded or new data might come in. Uh, but in case of e-commerce, the same cache needs to stay up all the time for weeks and months without any interruption. Okay. Uh, here's a typical example of what a code looks like. I'll actually take you to proper codes. Uh, but here you basically have a key, which is a string. And you, before you go to the database, you check the cache. If the cache has the data, you don't go to the database. Otherwise, you get the data from the database and you cache it. So the next time, you will not have to go to the database. Very simple logic. The keys, usually, because they're string-based, they need to contain type information. So, so there's no conflict between multiple keys. So if you have a usually a good idea to have a class name, then attribute name, and then the value as the key for individual. And then for other keys, you can have other formats. So a typical distributed cache is very, very simple to use. Uh, ASP.NET cache object was pretty much like, uh, it set the standard of what a cache should look like for .NET at least. Um, and so you usually connect to a cache, uh, ASP.NET cache was a standalone cache, so you didn't connect to the cache. It was all within your process. But a distributed cache, you always connect to a cache because it already exists. Um, and then you have a cache handle, and then you do a get, get contains, add, insert, insert, remove. Just very straightforward operations. So very easy to use. There's not a lot of complication. Um, and that makes it really easy to incorporate. Okay, let's go into uh, how you would, so, so the goal of using a distributed cache is to use as much data and put as much data into it as possible. The first goal was for application data caching that you need to keep the cache fresh. So how do you keep a cache fresh? Um, there are four different ways that you need to do that. The number one is what almost, pretty much everybody does, which is expirations. Um, let me, I'll show you. Gonna. So let me just open a small sample so I can we can just look at the actual code instead of just talking about it. I had all of these opened and then until I had to reboot. So, okay. So a, a typical uh, .NET project would reference a few of the cache libraries. In case of ncache, it is ncache.runtime, ncache.web. You would use a namespace of sorts. Uh, here in case of ncache, you've got these two namespaces, ncache.runtime and .caching. And you connect to the cache. At the beginning of your cache, you, you've got a cache handle now. And now you go and you, you create an object and you, um, you do cache.add. Here's your key, here's the actual object, and you've just added uh, an expiration of one minute. So you said keep this in the cache for one minute. This is called absolute expiration. So absolute expiration says just keep it for one minute you know, for whatever time you want to give it. R regardless of whether I'm using it or not, after one minute, I don't think it's safe to keep it in the cache because it, it might change in the database. So remove it from the cache. Uh, you can keep it for 10 seconds, 15 seconds. You can keep it for one hour, whatever. That's, and, and you do that on an object level. So for every object that you're caching, you specify uh, how long you think it's safe to cache it. Some objects which are more reference data, you can cache it you can say, don't expire this for two days or for one week. Some you want to only cache for 
So you specify the expiration here. Um, and the second expiration is called the, the sliding expiration. So the absolute expiration is for permanent data because you're saying that this data might change in the database, so don't keep it for longer. The sliding expiration serves a totally different purpose. It is for transient data. So it is not for permanent data. And you say it expire this if it's no longer being used. So it, it, you're not concerned with how long it stays in the cache as long as it's being used. Because it's, it's transient data, right? This is the, if you, if you remember, we said in the transient data, in these two cases, cache is the only place where the data exists. So there is no, there's no requirement, there's no need to synchronize this with any other place. The only need is that you uh, want to keep it in the cache as long as it's being used. And once it's no longer being used, you want the cache to kind of do a cleanup. So kind of remove it from it. So the transient data, the sliding expression basically uh, will specify a time span. Let's say here we said 30 minutes. And it will basically go and say expire this if it's not being used for 30 minutes. So a session state is a very good example. Uh, if nobody, if the user logs out after 20 minutes, you don't want the session around. So a sliding expression is usually for cleanup purposes. Absolute expression is for synchronization, for keeping the data clean. Uh, Same as if your session is being refreshed or I'm reloading the page, it's going to refresh 30 minutes or it's just that sort of like sliding expiration? In case of sessions, it is sliding. So as long as you're refreshing session, it's going to stay. If you, st if you st stay active the whole day, it's going to stay the whole day. It's only when you are no longer active, when you're not sending any more requests, against that session, it'll wait for 20 minutes or 30, whatever is the common uh, thing. And after that, it'll just go ahead and remove the session. Um, and this, that's only one example. Uh, even in other cases, even for transient data, you, you might have a lot of other data that you're creating uh, to share with other applications, even in a runtime data sharing situation. If you're saying, if, if nobody's using it, let's say you put something in the cache and you did event notification to all the people. So there are a lot of other people who are going to go and read it. Well, after they have read it, somebody's got to clean it up, right? So either you burden your application with it, or you just tell the cache, you know, after whatever interval of inactivity. And inactivity means either fetch or update. It does not, it's not only updates, also fetch. If you do a get, that's also an activity on that item. So in case of session, if you just do something, if you just fetch it, that's an activity. So, so transient data is you expire to the sliding expiration. Uh, now, there, there, there are two ways to clean up the cache. One is expiration, which is at an item level. The other is evictions. Evictions are when the cache is full. Uh, let's say you had set your expirations to be very long. So nothing is really expiring. And you keep adding more and more data because it's in memory cache and you don't want the cache to start going into virtual memory. You know, so if the cache starts to consume more memory than your RAM, then you're paging a lot. And paging pretty much kills the whole performance of having a fast cache. So that's why you put a limit on the cache and how much memory it should consume. A good cache should allow you to specify limits on how much memory it should consume. And once it reaches that limit, then there are only two things you can do. One, you either evict something so that you make room for new items. Or second, you stop accepting new items until things expire on their own. Um, usually, uh, it's better to evict. Because if you have reached that limit, that means, especially for application data, um, because there's also data in the database, so you can always reload it. In case of sessions, you don't want to evict. Uh, so in case of sessions, you don't want to reach that l level where you have to evict sessions. That means the sessions are still active, but you're, you're full. So you, you didn't do your capacity planning right. So, so that's the first way that you keep your data fresh. The second way is something that I, I think almost nobody provides other than NCache. But uh, this is where you actually synchronize the cache with the database. So you say, I really don't know how long I should keep this in the cache. You know, I, don't, I can't predict. Uh, so well, maybe I'll put a safety thing for expiration, but it might ex still 
change in the database. If that is the case, you need the cache to know about the fact that it changed in the database. So that's where the SQL dependency, there's a SQL dependency feature in SQL Server. Oracle has the same type of feature. These features use database events. So you can specify a, a data set uh, in the database and say, you know, here's my data set. And I'll actually, let me just show you that. Uh, Actually, I, I don't have an example of SQL dependency with me. But you basically, you, when you're adding the uh, item, you specify a dependency. You, you specify a SQL statement and say, select customer ID from customer where customer ID equals 1,000, because that's what matches this item. So now the cache becomes a database client, and it monitors the database. It tells the database, please notify me if this item changes, or this, this data set changes. Um, and when that changes, the database sends an event to the cache. The cache goes ahead and removes that item from the cache. So that way you, are, you can rest assured that that data will always be fresh. So a database synchronization is a very powerful way of doing So there are three ways that you can do database synchronization. Number one was SQL dependency, which is event-based. Um, events are great. I mean, they're, they're really real time, so, so you get it, but they're also heavy. The, they're heavy on the database. So if you have a million items in the cache, uh, you cannot create one million SQL dependencies on SQL. It's just going to crash. Because every SQL dependency creates a data structure within the DBMS. So when, you, when it comes to scalability, you, you need to also keep that factor in mind. For certain things, it's okay, it's good to, to create SQL dependencies, but if you're a lot of them, then you need to move to other alternatives, other options. So another option is DB dependency, which is where you do polling. So uh, the cache does polling, so you, know, you can cr create a custom table where the cache polls that table and say, if every item that changes, you update a flag in that table, and the cache picks up all the rows where that flag is true, and then it correspondingly removes items from the cache. Uh, so you, you have like a synchronization table um, with which you can actually uh, keep the cache synchronized. So a polling is a lot fast, a lot more efficient because in one poll you can synchronize thousands of items, which you cannot do with SQL dependency for you'll get thousands of events. But polling has also got limitations where if you had one table with maybe true or false or so something, that, that index in the database is going to be pretty huge, you know. So uh, even polling has limitations. So, for, so as, you, as the number of items that you need to synchronize grows, you need to move from SQL dependency to polling to CLR procedures. CLR procedures then is, is the option where you write a procedure and you call it from a database trigger. So whenever that row changes in the database, the, the trigger calls the procedure. The procedure calls your cache. And within the procedure, you need to make async calls because this procedure is usually being called within a database transaction. So if, if it's making synchronous calls, it might start to give timeouts in your database transactions. But by making async calls, you're able to um, avoid that. So synchronizing the cache with the database is really critical here. Any questions on this? So as a developer, you need to make the call from the database to NCache. Uh, and because you can make an async call, it, your, your CLR procedure does not block. Um, so, the, so, so, so you, you update your tr trigger, and you make the call to your procedure. From your procedure, you make call to NCache API. So NCache allows you, NCache client API can be embedded within a database engine. So it can, it, it's a fairly lightweight API so that you can call it from within the stored procedures. Quick question. For when that's going back out to do the synchronization, is the synchronization slower based on how many servers you have in that pool of cache servers? Uh, it depends which option you're taking. So 
for example, in a CLR procedure, since you're making an async call, right. you're going to come back immediately. Um, but the actual, regardless of how many servers you have, I don't know if I have that architectural diagram here. Regardless of how many servers you have in the cache, th this is a typical server. Every server is going to have one partition. And, one par and every partition is going to be replicated only to one other server. So it's like the RAID disk architecture. So, th so that way it's very scalable. Even if, even if you have 10, 20 servers in the, in the cluster, uh, you're only updating in two places. And even that, you're going to update the partition in a synchronous fashion. And the replica is usually updated in an async fashion from within the cache also. You can choose to update the replica in a synchronous fashion also depending on what the sensitivity of the data is. So, for example, so, some of our financial customers, um, if they're storing financial data, they're not going to do async replication because they just can't afford to. They don't want to be told that, okay, yeah, it got updated, but it really didn't get re replicated, and that partition went down, and that they just lost that $1 million worth of cash item. You know, uh, So they want to be told if it's not going to work. So... If they do, so they want to update the partition and the replica synchronously. It's slightly slower, but it's still linearly scalable. Did that answer your question? Okay. Go back. Uh, okay. Uh, the third is if you have non relational data, you want also, so it, it, the, the same rule applies with a relational database that also applies to a non-relational. So if you have a mainframe data or if you have uh, like data stored uh, that you can call through a web method, you can build your own dependencies, custom dependencies that can go and monitor. So the cache will call your, your, your code. Your code lives on the server. Uh, so that's anything... Um, the expirations and the database synchronization, there's no code that you have to write that lives on the cache server cluster. Uh, as soon as you go into custom dependencies, your code now gets deployed as part of the cache cluster. So the cache calls your code. So it's called server-side code. Uh, that's also something that you'll see that most caches don't support. Um, by having a, a, a custom dependency, your code, you can now go and monitor your own customized data source. NCache will call it, let's say, uh, and, and you go and monitor it, and then you tell NCache, well, this thing changed. NCache will then, at that time, remove that item from the cache. Or, uh, the, on the next to, next to next slide, if you have the read-through implemented, you can also automatically reload the data. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so you want to be able to synchronize. The fourth one is if you have relational data, you want to be able to manage relationships. So if you have a customer and has a collection of orders and you've cached them all in the cache, uh, if you remove the customer from the cache, maybe the orders should not remain in the cache. Because what if you've deleted that customer from the database? Although this is not a good example of deletion, you don't really delete customers, but there could be another situation where there's a one-to-many relationship as soon as you remove the one item from the cache, the, the many items should automatically be removed from the cache. And that's where the cache dependency feature, that's a feature that's part of the ASP.NET cache object also, and cache also su supports it. That makes it really easy. You just specify the dependencies. This item depends on this item, and you can do cascaded also. And then if you ever update this or remove, all the other items are automatically removed from the cache. Now, removing from the cache in case of application data, again, we're talking application data, means that the next time you need it, you'll get it from the database and put it in the cache. So removing really is a way to kind of refresh the data. So these are the four ways that you make sure that your cache stays uh, fresh. You don't have to worry about the cache ever going bad. And as soon as you no longer have to worry about this, you can cache practically everything. And the more data you cache, the, more, uh, the less you have to go to the database. And that's where the true benefit of the cache comes. Uh, a lot of the people, they just li limit themselves to this, and that forces them to uh, really cache a very small subset of data. So you're really not benefiting from that infrastructure that you've built. Uh, second, so let's assume that you have a cache that allows you to cache a lot of data. 
Well, the more data you cache, the more you have a need to find data. And if you only found data based on a key, it would make your application pretty painful. You know, just like in a database, you want to be able to search things. Um, you, you want to be able to get collections of items back. You, want, you, you should be able to do the same with the cache. So uh, you know, a bulk get or a SQL search, either SQL or, or link, is something that almost becomes essential if you're going to have a cache that is allowing you to cache all the data. So a lot of the reference data, uh, you just uh, have the same queries that you would issue against a database, now you issue a, against the cache. Pretty much, pretty close to it. You can't do joins in the cache, but you can do other things that would kind of overcome the limitation of not doing joins. So let me show you what a SQL query looks like. Again, the same thing you would do, you know, you reference your assemblies and the namespaces, you connect to the cache, do all of that, and now, now you just go ahead and you issue a query. You could either do this based on an object or on a string, um, and uh, you execute the, this. You, you, you can, in case of NK, you can do this uh, either as a search entries where you get a dictionary back or you could actually get a, like a record set back, just like you would with a C SQL server so that you can kind of iterate over it and get e individual columns if you want to. Or, uh, so allowing you to search based on attributes uh, means that suddenly you are no longer limited to only the keys. And that's... When you do a, an SQL query, you need to search the data that you know is, uh, that data set is all in the cache. Because if some of the data is in the cache, some of it in the database, um, then you will get incomplete data. Uh, and if the item, so, so, so that's, how, that, that's a very good question. So when you're issuing a SQL queries, you're usually issuing it against collections of data. Collections of data usually means reference data. Re reference data is something that you uh, either don't expire or when you expire, you automatically reload. So let me, I, I think this is probably a good time. I'm, I'm just going to jump ahead and then come back. So there's a feature called read through uh, that NCache has. Um, many of the Java caches have it, but the .NET, on the .NET side, I think NCache is the only one that has it. Uh, so the read through is a hand, it's, a, it's code that you write. Uh, here's what that code looks like. Um, so I will have, uh, so, so I'm, again, the same way you would reference uh, di different uh, assemblies. So there's the dot web and dot runtime and dot end cache. You use the different namespaces here. And now you implement this I read through provider interface. This interface has three methods, load from source, which is like the initialization, I'm sorry, the init is the initialization method, which is called at the time you start the cache. So it, that allows your read through handler to connect to your data sources. Read through is your code that runs on the cache cluster. So essentially, if you see this picture here, your code runs on every server. And on which server it runs, that's, that's uh, the determined, in case of NCache, that is determined by what the key was. So, so whichever partition the key was, that's where the code is going to run. But it, it, it allows you to do parallel processing also. But the read through is this code that runs here. Um, and initialize, and there's at the end of this dispose. And then this is the method that gets called uh, it gives so you, you pass a key, it gives you back a cache item, which has a lot of other stuff. It has the actual key, or actual value, and also 
expiration details and other things that you want to set. So this code gets registered with NCache, NCache calls it, uh, and um, basically allows you to read data from your data source. Same way, it, there's a write-through handler. I'll quickly sh show you that. Works exactly the same way. There's init and dispose, except now the, where did the other method go? So you have the write to data source, and you can also do a bulk write. So if you, if you do a bulk operation, you can have, go to the database also in bulk. So the benefit of read through, of course, is that you, you go into the cache, you say cache.get. Cache doesn't have the item. Well, cache knows your database, so ca cache calls the read through handler. The read through handler goes and gets the data from the database. And cache puts it in the cache and gives it back to you. So from your application's perspective, the cache always has the data. Um, and so that's one benefit. It's kind of you centralize all your data access for some of your data, not all of it. For some of your data, you centralize the data access to the caching tier. So it simplifies your applications. The second benefit is that when you do expirations, instead of removing the item from the cache, you say reload it. So the item never gets removed, it only gets updated. So that also could answer your question is that if you had reference data that you know, the, the product prices have to be updated or whatever, you know. Well, if you remove it and you issue the SQL qu query, you could have that technical uh, race condition where some of the data wasn't there. So the product wasn't even available because it got expired because you had to reload it from the. So that's where you want to combine expirations with read through. So when you combine expirations with read through, they never get expired. Well, they never get removed. They only, when the expiration comes, NCache calls the read through handler, gets a new copy of the data from the database and updates that item in the, in the, in the cache. So the same thing goes with SQL dependency. When the data changes in the database, instead of removing it, NCache calls the read through handler, reloads it from the database. Um, and the same thing goes with custom dependency. So in all these situations, if you combine the read through, you get two benefits. One, you centralize all your data access. So you know, cache.get is a lot simpler code than all that ADO.net code that you need to do. Second, you can do, uh, you, you, you can rest assured that data in the data in the cache will not only stay fresh, but it'll always be there for the SQL queries. Um, the, uh, Many cases, you want to get f collections of data from the database. Let's say you get a, a record set and you want to cache every item separately. So that, that's a, a situation where a read through is always associated with one key. So one key to one read through. You can do a bulk uh, operation, like you, you could do a bulk update, but every read through, every read through execution is one key. So that's the, that's the limitation or, or that's the nature of the read-through handler mechanism where it needs to be mapped to a key. So if you can map, whatever you can map to a key, get it through read-through. Excuse me? Uh -huh. um, for the first approach, the read-through? I mean, the, the la last one, the stored pr procedure for the database synchronization, Right? Now, can you send this yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So the, the, when you're doing the SQL dependency, SQL dependency is an SQL server feature. And it allows you to either call an SQL statement, dynamic statement, or actually also have a stored procedure call. Because whatever you specify there gets sent to the SQL server, and that SQL server executes it and creates a data set. And then it monitors that data set. Right. But now with the read through, you kind of uh, 
is that true or as a developer I need to be aware how many read-through can happen or? Actually, as a developer, you, you just need to use the read-through. When you're deploying, that's when the infrastructure team will need to say, okay, how much memory do we need in each box based on how much data we're going to, you know. So the, the capacity planning is based on your average use case and your estimation of how many users are going to log in in the peak time versus non-peak time, what an average user, what type of calls is going to make. And you, with, in case of NCache, at least, you can kind of go through a simulation. You, you, you can plug in NCache, go through all your test cases, and pretty soon you'll see how much data a typical user or set of scenarios is caching. And then multiply that by your uh, peak consumption, add some extra buffer on top of it, and that's your memory. That's how many, sometimes you need to add more servers because of memory, sometimes you need to add them because of CPU. So if you, if you have 16 or 32 gig in each server, which is pretty much the standard configuration, and if you've got four servers, maybe you need to have five. Uh, because you have more more capacity, but you never want to go to virtual to to the paging situation because paging just kills performance. Okay, so the read through is uh, I, I talked about the write through is also a really great feature because you don't want to wait for the database to be updated at times, uh, so you just update the cache. It's updating the cache is much faster than updating the database. Uh, and the cache can then update the database either in synchronous fashion if you want to make sure that it is done uh, um, at the same time or it can be done asynchronous. Most of the data you can asynchronously update the database. Now asynchronous does not mean that you won't be notified uh, if the update fails. Asynchronous only means that you can then you know, queue it up and then even do bulk updates um, and the application, suddenly the application performance improves dramatically. Um, so the write-through write has a variation called write-behind, which pretty much is the same write-through, except instead of calling it synchronously, you queue it up, and, and the, on the queue it gets called. And the queue then, in case of NCache, the queue also gets replicated, so if, if any one <laughs> server goes down, you know, the, the, the queue is not lost. Uh, and if a any update fails, then I think NCache read tries it. There's a, there's a bunch of logic that's built into the write through and write behind. Um, so the write through is there to, again, centralize all the database operations, and write behind is there to speed up so that you don't even have to wait for the database. Again, when you're talking scalability, we're not, we're not talking five users. The problems that you're going to face with five users is very different than what you'll face with five with 50,000 users. Suddenly everything becomes really, really big issue. And memory is pretty much the answer to this. You know, disk is something that is just not there uh, yet, uh, whatever the permanent storage technology is there. So memory is the way to go if you want to really get super fast, predictable performance, regardless of how much um, load you have. And you know, so the right behind is part of that in, in memory, taking advantage of it. Any questions? Okay, so when you're, just to complete this topic, you know, the fact that you want to be able to search uh, means that you, want, you, you need to be able to index attributes. So because all the data is usually, in case of e-commerce, you know, those online applications, all the data is kept in a serialized form. All the objects are serialized and kept in a serialized form. In case of big data, you can, in case, you know, with NCache, it allows you to store data in an object form. But in case of e-commerce, which is the web applications and the web services, keeping data in an object form does not help you. It actually makes things slower. Uh, so you want to be able to index uh, so that you can, so NCache, in case of this, NCache allows you to create indices on attributes. Um, and then also, what if you're storing text? What if you're storing text? How do you index the text? Well, uh, then you can use these things called tags and name tags. Tags is also something that App Fabric also had uh, as a feature that NCache has also. And name tags is sort of is a key and value. So name tags is your index uh, for attributes. So if you have a large text, you come up with the keys and the values. So every key is an attribute, a name, 
and the value is the v v value of the attribute. So whatever text you're storing, you can specify multiple name tags, uh, and later on, and all of this can be then indexed. It, actually, it does get indexed automatically, and you can include that as part of your search, your SQL query. So when you're doing that, this dot uh, customer dot city equals New York. Uh, you know, that was the attribute of a customer object. Now you would say this dot, whatever text dot attribute name equals this. So you, by having named attributes, you can also t sort of tag freeform text um, in different ways. So data grouping is, is a way to allow you to overcome the limitations of joins, you know, the, or the lack of joins that a distributed cache does not allow you to have joins. Um, none of them do, as far as I know. N cache doesn't, and uh, none of them do. Uh, so you can use other ways. So grouping tags and name tags is a way to, you can get a collection of data back based on those joins, cache it, and multiple items, and then fetch it based on the groups and tags and name tags. Um, any questions? What's the time? 11.45, okay. How much time do we have for each speaker? An hour, an hour and 15 minutes or something? Yeah, so... Uh, until noon, okay, good. So, you know, we're making good progress, I think. Uh, so we've talked about read through, write through, write behind. We've talked about the auto reload based on expiration and database synchronization that read through can do. And the write behind being really super fast. Uh, or in terms of d doing it asynchronously. Uh, runtime data sharing. Uh, this is a feature that NCache has. This is a feature that Re uh, Redis also has, also, um, where you basically, although NCache has more uh, details or more of it than they do, but um, so you have different ways that you want to be notified uh, when certain, th certain things happen in the cache. So there's key-based events where you just say, if this item ever is updated or removed, notify me. That's the simplest way of being notified. Um, but you as the application is, you know what that item is, and you want to be notified based on that item. Um, and let me sir, see if I can have... Where are the events? Uh, 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 so that's the first. The second is you want to just get cache level events. If anything in the cache is updated or removed, please notify me. The third is custom events where you, you have these custom events, which is, which is what you use for PubSub. So you have a customized, it's like a topic. You say this thing, if, if anybody fires this event, please notify me. I mean, I'm interested, and that could be a logical event name, something, you know, you know, so there's a, as a consumer of things, you're saying when my publisher publishes this data, he's going to fire this custom event call, uh, I've published this data. So I want to be notified at that time. So when that happens, you will, the cache notifies you. So the cache basically becomes, um, this whole cluster becomes your enterprise service bus. You know, so, so you can be connected. I mean, you, you can be any of these servers um, and you'll be notified. You can be a Java application and a .NET application did something and you'll be, no, in case of any cache, you'll be notified. So both .NET and Java applications can share data at runtime. And that data also, those objects get translated automatically from .NET to Java also at a binary level. Uh, so that's the custom event. Um, and here's, actually I do have a, example for the custom event. Let me just show you. Where did it go? 
My, I haven't actually seen this co code, so I'm not able to. Uh, it goes into. My apologies. No, I'm just going to skip that. But so you, so you 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 can actually uh, so basically you provide a callback. You register it with NCache, and NCache calls it. Uh, that callback could be a .NET, or it could be a Java callback, and then NCache fires that event to you. So in all of these things, you, you specify a callback, uh, and then your callback gets called. Uh, continuous query is essentially a SQL dependency, except it's not on the database. It's a, it's a, it's a cache dependency. It's a, it's a de equivalent of a SQL dependency on the cache. So you specify, I hope I have a continuous query here. There, I'm pretty sure. So, so you specify in case of a continuous query, uh, an SQL statement. Say, I want to monitor this data set. So in, let's, um, let's say you, you want to monitor all the customers that are in New York. So if any customer object matching that criteria is added, updated or removed from the cache, you want to be notified. So by specifying that criteria based, you no longer have to know of individual objects. So in the key based, you had to know every key. At the cache based, you just said everything in the cache, which if anything in the cache is added, updated, or removed, please notify me, which is a very powerful feature, but at times it might become too chatty, you know, especially if you've got a lot of data. Then you had custom events, which was more of if this specific topic is fired by my publisher, then notify me. And the fourth is, I just want to monitor data based on this criteria. So the, the continuous query is a very scalable model, unlike SQL dependency, which is kept only in one database. This is kept within the cluster. So it is scalable, but it works in the same fashion logically, that this data set uh, is monitored by the cache cluster. So if any objects are updated in this data set, you will be notified. Um, so this allows you to use the cache as a really powerful way of sharing data across multiple instances of your application or across multiple applications. Because you have the infrastructure in-house, why not use this instead of building another message queuing infrastructure? Any qu questions up until now? And then I think I'm just going to go into Quickly, I'll go into a, a, a couple of architectural things about what a cache should have. Um, Generally, is this always in-house? Your, your web application, say if you're running something on Azure, you have your web app up there. Do you also have your cluster up there? Of course, of course. In fact, uh, many of our customers use NCache within the Azure deployment. So you would deploy the cache servers as separate VMs but in the same region as your application. And the client portion, of course, is your part of the app, your application VM, whether that is a, a dedicated VM or it's a worker role or a web role or it's a website. So whatever it is that you have, you just put the client part of NCache. That's the API there. That client talks to the cache cluster at, based on TCP connections, and it, it all works in a seamless fashion. So for NCache, Azure is just another environment. Um, that pe pe people use. But the difference, now, there's one thing that I did want to say here. If you were to use Redis, for example, on Azure, they give you cache as a service model. So the ca it, it's easier to use, of course. There's nothing for you to do. You just make the API calls. Everything else is taken care of for you. But that's also the problem, because you don't have control over it. Uh, we, we chose consciously to go with the VM model where the VMs are part of your deployment. So if you have a more serious application, you definitely want the VMs as part of your application so you can monitor them. There's a, a lot of monitoring that you need to be able to do about really what's happening. Sh should I add another box or not? Are they going to really add it at the right time? Or, or, you know, so you want to really control that. So that's the first part. Second, you want all these server-side code, the, the read-through, write-through that you cannot have if, if, it's a, if it's a cache as a service. Um, in the case of Redis, it's because it, it wasn't even a .NET-based cache. Um, 
they don't even have that f those features. But even if they did, even if a cache had read-through, write-through features, let's say if we were to do end cache as a service, we would not be able to provide you the server-side code because then that defeats the whole purpose of being a service. You know, it's no longer a black box. So it's a trade-off between simplicity versus functionality. So if you have a more serious application, I would encourage you to go with the VM model. Um, and and uh, uh, especially the read-through, write-through features. Any other question? Okay. Let me just quickly talk about a couple. I, I'm going to skip the ASP.NET stuff. I, I think we've talked about that. You know this already. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's this feature called uh, client cache that is something that NCache has that I don't think anybody else does also. It's a really powerful feature. Uh, the Java caches do have it, but I don't think anybody on the .NET side has it. So the client cache is also, some people also call it near cache. It's a local cache. Uh, it's an in-proc cache most of the time, but it can be out-proc also if you have a lot of worker processes. So if you have an application tier here, and you have a caching tier here, well, this is great because you're not going to the database as much. We're still going across the network to the caching tier. What if you wanted the performance of that in-proc cache for a lot of your data? Uh, you could use this client cache feature, which essentially, whatever you're fetching from the caching tier, it automatically gets copied to your local cache. So the local cache is in proc. It keeps objects in, a, in an object form. Um, and so it's orders of magnitude faster than going to the caching tier, which is already orders of magnitude faster than going to the database. Um, can I use it without the cluster? You can use it. Yeah, if you use it without the, the cluster, then it's just a standalone cache. But then the real benefit comes when you use it with the cluster because you're getting the benefit of that standalone cache, but at the same time benefit of the scalability. So some of the data, based on your usage pattern, each application is going to have its own variation of the client cache in terms of data, whatever it was fetching. But whatever you're fetching, you have the comfort that is always synchronized. So if somebody changes that data in the caching tier, the caching tier knows you. It notifies the client cache and says, please go and update yourself with this data. It's not synchronous. It's asynchronous. So it has a slight delay. It may have a a millisecond or so delay, but it, that's acceptable in 99% of the cases. Uh, but in exchange, you're suddenly now getting you know, object form on your heap. So that's, that's the data that you have. And the client cache, you know, m many of our customers, have, for example, the caching tier, 16 gig is pretty much standard, 32 is, between 16 and 32 is the RAM. And the application server for their own usage they had 8 to 16 gig as the memory. Uh, so what they do is they put about 1 gig on the client cache. So they, give, they, they allocate 1 gig for the client cache. Doing that, now 1 gig is a pretty large data for that one client cache. Your ca the total cache might be 50 gig or 100 gig in, you know, based on how big the cluster was. And every client may have 1 gig or 2 gig or 3 gig as the, the, the client cache. Um, in proc is the most common, but if you have multiple worker processes, let's say if, the, if this is an ASP.NET web farm and each web server has eight worker processes, then you don't want to have two gigs of client cache multiplied times eight because that's going to, it just defeats the whole purpose. Then you want to have an out proc cache uh, here. So end cache allows you to do both. The most common being in proc, but you need to have usually one worker process, maybe two at most. Um, but if you want to go more than that, then just change it to outproc. All that's just a configuration change. But a client cache is a really, really powerful feature, and you use it when you have more read intensive, which is bulk of your application data caching. You don't use it with sessions, f for example. It actually makes things worse. Because in, in session state, there's the number of reads and the number of writes are equal in terms of... so. If this increase, so the writes are being done in two places now. So now suddenly you have um, doubled the number of writes. So that just slowed you down. So that's one aspect. The second 
thing, and, and there's, in case of NCache, it also does WAN replication if you have multiple data centers, but I wanted to actually come here. So there are d different caching topologies that, uh, that NCache gives you. So the first one is called mirrored cache. It's a two-node active passive. The second one is called replicated cache, where you can have multiple servers. Every server has an entire copy of the cache. Good for reference data, uh, but it doesn't scale in terms of storage as you add more servers. Third is partition cache, which is, uh, there's no replication, but you can have a partition replica, which is like partition cache with replication. This is our most popular topology. So every server has one partition, every, and that partition is backed up onto another server. All that is done for you automatically, by the way. I'm just explaining the architecture. Um, and the partitions are created automatically. The number of buckets assigned to each partition is done automatically. There's a data balancing feature, so if so, some of the partitions get overwhelmed because most of the keys were mapping to those buckets, then it automatically moves some of the buckets to other uh, partitions. So uh, really very scalable and powerful feature. So these are the things that you should know about when you're choosing which cache you should use uh, once you're convinced that you should use a cache. Any questions? I, I think I'm pretty much done. Oh, it's, it's, exactly. It's, it's just like the RAID disk architecture, except it's all in memory. And it's extremely scalable. You, you, know, you, you can grow this to be as much as you want. E-commerce applications usually don't grow the cache cluster to be more than 10, 15 nodes. Uh, if you have, because it's a 4 to 1 or 5 to 1 ratio between the application tier and the caching tier. That's what we see as the most common. So every four servers, you have one cache server. Uh, and minimum of two cache servers. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate your time. Thank you.